Then of course you've got trauma. You've got mechanical disruptions, severing, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, very uh, rapidly uh, uh, progressive uh, autoimmune effects also that can damage uh, neurons and require regeneration or, or grafting strategies. So we'll talk about those next. Uh, regeneration in the peripheral nervous system, how engineers can uh, actually carry out interventions to help uh, regrowth of axons. Now, sometimes there'll be a simple transection, you know, an accidental knife wound, uh, and if it's clean, if it's uh, well localized, you can do relatively simple stitching. You try to align these bundles of axons within the overall peripheral nerve. You can actually just kind of look at it and see these bundles, which are called fascicles. You can uh, sew, basically sew it back together. Sew back the fascicles, sew back the overall nerve. And peripheral nervous system axons will regrow. They'll grow all the way back to their target muscle. They'll find the right muscle and they'll re-innervate it. They regrow at about one millimeter a day. Central nervous system axons do not do this. It's actually thought that the CNS astrocytes actually actively impair the process of regrowth. And some classic studies have been carried out showing this, transplanting central nervous system astrocytes into peripheral nervous system grafts, and that prevents the regrowth of these peripheral nervous system axons. Um, eventually, they get there, uh, and this is just a, a nice diagram illustrating the uh, regrowth of uh, axons across the, uh, the cell bundle. Now, sometimes, it, yeah. Yeah, good question. Why is this? And it's, it's not an accident. It's a very active process. The CNS astrocytes are very clearly uh, very effective and efficient at preventing regrowth. Any ideas on that? Why would there be this active impairment of regrowth? In the CNS? Nobody really knows, but there's a lot of interesting speculation. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh, you know, the, the central nervous system is, is a pretty amazing thing, and it's very tightly balanced in a number of ways. Uh, you know, a, a, a slight regrowth, an over-exuberant regrowth to a muscle just means that muscle is a little more strongly recruited. A, an over-exuberant regrowth in the brain could lead to seizures, um, could lead to um, you know, uh, more global behavioral disruptions that are fatal to the, to the animal. And so actually, I. Uh, it's probably the case that there's a evolutionary calculation there that it's okay to suffer small focal dysfunction uh, if, if you eliminate the risk of a more global dysfunction. Um, now, sometimes the disruption is is uh, large enough; it's not clean. There's damage in between, so you actually need to help the regrowth happen. And so there are various kinds of bridges or conduits that you can create. Uh, and this is an active area of biomedical research. You can actually use autologous tissue, meaning tissue from the patient, and you can take that from veins, from muscle. You can take neural sheaths uh, from other nerves that uh, are intact. You can even use tendons, and you can try to create uh, bridging structures or conduits that uh, uh, can be sewn into either end of the graft and help the axons grow across. Take that from the patient, uh, and that prevents uh, autoimmune interactions. You can also do transplants from other individuals. These are non-autologous, so not from the patient, uh, but from someone else. You can reduce immune reactions by making them acellular, so you can actually use their physical form, but digest away or, or remove the cells themselves. Or you can give immunosuppressants uh, to the patient, and that helps the, the graft uh, uh, survive. You can also use materials, uh, biomaterials of various kinds that are natural. You can use collagen, laminin, extracellular matrix type proteins, and you can actually build graphs from that. And then finally, there are synthetic materials, purely synthetic materials, um, you know, uh, polylactic uh, co-glycolic co co acid, PLGA is widely used, uh, polylactic acid. Um, and this is, um, all these sorts of uh, conduits can be coupled with other kinds of interventions. You could include support cells that secrete growth factors that facilitate axon growth. Uh, you could have electrical activity that might uh, stimulate growth. This is not known uh, uh, to be effective, but might be. You could have interluminal channels, which might help guide subsections, uh, much like your different uh, fascicles of your, of your 
nerves in the native uh, uh, axon bone. And this is an example of some of these uh, foam polyolactic acid uh, nerve guidance channels that are implanted and facilitate growth in uh, rat models, rat sciatic nerves. Which can help. You can make them biodegradable or not in uh, active area of research. Now, what if you wanted to come in and control the axons? What if you wanted to deliver electrical pulses? Maybe you want to provide a uh, stimulus to facilitate function. And so you can actually build into your cuff or your channel electrodes. And, uh, you know, this then raises this question, is there any way to selectively stimulate individual kinds of axons within the bundle? And this becomes a really acute challenge within any peripheral nerve. They're, they're, first of all, there are nerves going both ways. There are afferents and efferents. So there are nerves going out that control motion. There are nerves coming back that carry sensation. And so that's, that's one problem. And then all the ones that are controlling sensation, well, there's a huge variety of those. There are pain neurons. There are fine touch sensation, vibration sensation. If you just stimulate everything in a peripheral nerve, you could be causing, you know, pain. You could be causing uh, coarse movements, fine movements, uh, you know, total chaos. How, how could you come in and just control a subset of those fibers? Broad general question. Any, any sort of ideas or thoughts? Uh, what, what kinds of things might allow you to, to pick out subsets of axons? They're all intermixed as they are within the nerve. Possible. Interesting. So you'd have some closed loop, so maybe tied to a, a motion, you'd detect like a, a spike pattern that was closely tied to movement, and then you'd know that those were the movement axons, and then you would maybe focally stimulate that region where you detected those, something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then, okay, so that's also interesting. So you could either selectively stimulate that one or selectively non-stimulate it by delivering a pulse very soon after it fired when it was refractory but the others were not. Yeah, you could imagine closed loop systems like that. It's actually a big challenge. Uh, there are, um, electrically it's very hard. The one trend that's known is that um, the larger diameter fibers are more sensitive. They can be triggered more easily, um, which it's actually kind of backwards from the way you want uh, things to happen. Those larger axons trigger, recruit many what are called motor units, large areas of muscle. They're involved in force movements. And so, but when you're trying to give just a very small stimulus to cause a tiny movement, you're actually going to be selectively recruiting those big coarse movement fibers first. So you end up, instead of having the ability to, you know, pick up something fine, you have a very, very ballistic uh, uh, coarse movement. So that's been a real problem, um, and th the reason for that is not fully understood, but it's thought that uh, you need a very steep electric field uh, gradient. Um, what really happens is you're triggering a, a circuit uh, between nodes of Ranvier, and you don't want the two nodes to be at the same potential as a result of your stimulation, or you won't get current flow. So you need steep field uh, gradients. Now, nodes of Ranvier are more widely spaced in larger diameter axons, and so it becomes easier to recruit them because their nodes are widely spaced and even a more shallow field gradient will recruit them. Um, and these big efferent motor fibers that control coarse movements are 10 to 20 microns in diameter. The good thing is you're not going to recruit the pain fibers, which are very small and thin, so you actually can control movements without causing pain by using low uh, intensity stimulation. Still, though, that's the one sort of trend we have in terms of electrodes. A lot of different cuffs have been made, uh, you know, uh, arrays of electrodes that you can stick into nerves and neural tissue and stimulate them. Um, there are uh, conduits that have electrodes built in. This is one designed by a bioengineering uh, professor here, uh, Greg Kovacs, uh, and his group. Um, but electrodes are fundamentally limited, bottom line, as they can't really get the level of selectivity that we'd like. 